Hi, I'm Steve Curry, President of Radial Engines Limited, and I'd like to welcome you to this second in our series of radial engine maintenance videos. We made these videos in response to many requests from radial engine owners, operators, and mechanics for more detailed information than the existing maintenance literature gives. Our first video, Maintaining the Jacobs Radial Engine, has been well received, and many requests for a similar treatment of the Continental W670 led us to this production. As most of you probably know, it's been more than 30 years now since radial engine overhaul and maintenance has been taught in most A&P schools, and a generation has passed since most of these things were common knowledge. The most current of the maintenance literature for the W670 engine is the Overhaul, Maintenance, and Parts Catalog for Model W670 Aircraft Engines, Form X30009, published in December of 1956, more than 50 years ago. As with most of the aircraft uh, and engine maintenance literature of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, this manual assumes a base of common knowledge concerning radial engines that is mostly missing today. As a result, the manual seems sketchy and incomplete. Our hope is, with these videos, we'll be able to flesh out the maintenance literature and fill in some blanks that might exist today. The information presented here will not replace this book, and you'll need a copy to be able to safely maintain your engine. The few places where we will disagree with the published maintenance instructions and data are where there are glaring errors, and these things have been reported to both Teledyne Continental and to the FAA and are being corrected. If you do not have a copy of the manual, you can contact us and we'll furnish you a copy for a nominal fee. Now let's talk a little bit about the history of the Continental engine. Continental Motors Company was founded in 1905 with the introduction of a four-cylinder engine for trucks, cars, and stationary industrial applications. In 1906, Continental released the 45-horsepower Type O engine for aircraft. This 1918 advertisement from Literary Digest shows a World War I scene with some trucks and aircraft powered by Continental engines. In the center of the ad is a picture of the Type O aircraft engine. Continental advertised themselves here as the largest exclusive motor manufacturer in the world. 1929 was a pivotal year for Continental with the formation of Continental Aircraft Engine Company and the release of the A-70 radial aircraft engine. This ad from Aero Digest shows a later 170 horsepower version of the A-70. The A-70 had many of the features that would become a part of the W670 design. It was seven-cylinder, normally aspirated, and used the, the Bendix Centilla Magnetos and a Bendix Stromberg carburetor. The cylinder barrels were screwed and shrunk onto the heads, and the crankshaft was a two-piece unit, as was the crank case. In March of 1932, Continental introduced the W670 engine, which was in many ways just a bigger version of the A70. The bore and stroke were enlarged, and the horsepower was increased to 210 horsepower. This engine, which was available with either a front or a rear exhaust collector, became a popular engine for several aircraft and was the most commonly installed on WACO biplanes. Over the next few years, several variant dash numbers of the W670 engine were released, beginning with the W670A and ending with the W670M. Horsepower ratings on these engines varied from 210 to 250 horsepower. All of these engines were built for the civilian aircraft market, and since there was a Great Depression on, none of them were built in large numbers. It was not until early 1941 when the military began ordering thousands of R670-4 and R670-5 220 horsepower engines that Continental, uh, that we were now familiar with, began to appear on the Boeing Model 75 Stearman Cadet. Of the 10,000 or so Stearmans built, 5,921 were equipped with 220 horsepower W670 engines. 
When you factor in the spare engines, which were often were five engines per plane, the total quantity of W670s produced during the war totaled in excess of 25,000 units. All the early W670s were manually greased, but the ones for the military sported automatic valve lubrication. Continental also manufactured thousands of tank engines and that shared some parts with their aircraft engines, but is also quite a different engine from its aircraft cousin. These engines powered light tanks, such as the Stewart tank, as well as landing craft and shipboard stationary applications. We overhauled the engine for this landing craft, which was then used in the 2006 Clint Eastwood film, Flags of Our Fathers. This engine had suffered a liquid lock with a subsequent broken link rod, a fairly common problem with radial engines, and the one that we'll discuss at length in a few minutes. Now let's go out into the shop and we'll look at some of the W670 engine differences. Well, here we are in final assembly. Not surprisingly, this is the room where uh, the engines are put together after all of the engine parts have gone through the various overhaul and inspection uh, procedures in the other parts of the shop. And we have our, our overhaul manual with us, and we'll be using it in a little bit. Um, kind of a neat thing about the Continental Overhaul Manual is that everything is, uh, is under one cover. Most of the other manufacturers, Jacobs, Pratt & Whitney, um, Lycoming, put their manuals in, in separate manuals. So you would have an operator's manual and a service manual, an overhaul manual and a parts manual, and sometimes even uh, service bulletins in uh, each in separate covers. So it seemed like that no matter which manual you needed at any given time, it was the one you couldn't find. But uh, Continental put everything under one cover. So we have the, the overhaul parts catalog, uh, the service manual, everything is, uh, is in this manual. So that's, uh, that's kind of a nice thing. And it also makes it a lot less expensive because rather than having to purchase uh, five or six separate manuals, there's, there's just one to buy. So anyway, um, this is our manual. We'll be using it in just a little bit. This is a W670-6A 220-horse uh, Continental engine. The W670-6A uh, and the W676N engines are the ones that, uh, that probably 99% of the engines, the Continental engines that you see, will either be a W676A or W676N. There are some differences in those two models, and we'll look at those in a minute. But from the front of the engine, the only way that we can tell the difference between a 6A and a 6N is by the serial number and what is stamped on the data plate. Now, Continental was also a little bit unusual in that they uh, embossed their serial number of the engine up here in big quarter-inch letters into the case, and then in addition to that, on the data plate, which is down here below the crankshaft and above the sump, it is again stamped, both the engine model and the, uh, and the serial number. And it's very important that the serial number here and the serial number on the data plate match. That's, uh, that's just an important issue with, uh, with Continental engines. So let's look at, uh, in the overhaul manual, on page 13, we have... Um, what is called the general description of the engines. And, um, and the, the first thing that it has here is a listing of all the different serial numbers of the engines and then which model it, it was originally and which model it should be. So our serial number here is 15091, and this is a W676A. Well, first off, let's make sure that this serial number and this serial number match. It's 15091 there, and it is 15091 here, and it's stamped as a W676A. Now, if we go to our general descrip description page, we find that all serial numbers 13000 through 24999, which 15091 falls in that bracket, was a W676A engine that was originally manufactured for the Air Corps. And so, um, so we verified that our serial number here and our serial number here match, and that this serial number and this serial number are indeed W676A engines. Now let's go around to the, um, to the back of the engine and we'll look at some of these other differences. Um, if we turn to page, the next page, 14, 
and page 15, it goes into a, a great detail describing the differences between the models of the engines. And so uh, talks about the difference between the 6N and the 6A and the 6N and the Dash 16 and, and just all the different engine models, uh, the differences. And so we'll go around back and take a look at these differences. All right, here we are on the back side of the W676A engine. And, um, and now the differences begin to show up between the 6A and the 6N. All of the 6A engines are set up for VMN7 DF or a DFA magnetos, one of the two. Uh, the DF magnetos are, uh, are fixed rotating magnet uh, magnetos. The DFAs have automatic advance mechanisms in them and that's, uh, that's a separate approval. But these, um, uh, the magnetos are the VMN7s or the small mags. Now the other option is the SF7RN1 magneto that you find on the W676N. This is a W676N magneto, the SF7RN1. As you can see physically, it's a larger magneto. And so um, uh, in the, the common parlance, this is the large mag and the, the VMN7 is the small mag. Um, because of the magneto differences, the accessory cases are also different. This snap that is machined on the SF7 RN1 is, uh, is a large snap. The one that's machined on the VMN is a much smaller snap, and so the accessory cases are completely different accessory cases. If we pulled this, uh, this VMN7 magneto off of here and tried to put the SF7 on, it wouldn't go. And it wouldn't go for two reasons. One is because of the snap. The other is because the magneto drive gears are actually different in inside the engine. So this is a, is a coarser spline and the, um, the VMN series is a finer spline magneto drive gear. And so these, uh, these are definitely not interchangeable magnetos and uh, we'll get into a little more detail about timing the magnetos uh, in a later section. The other differences that you'll find between the, uh, the 6A and the 6N engine primarily are in the uh, oil scavenge pump and we'll look at that in a little more detail in, in a couple minutes. And then also because the, uh, the VMN series magneto uh, mounts closer with the magneto blocks to the, um, to the accessory case, the actual ignition harness is different too. And so the ignition harness for the VMN is a little bit shorter in this area than for the SF7, which is a, uh, uh, a taller magneto. So ignition harness, the, um, the oil rocker oil scavenge pump, and the magnetos are the primary differences. There's also a difference in the sumps, in the, um, uh, the thread count on the sump plug. Uh, an 18 uh, threads per inch plug versus a 20 threads per inch plug. But uh, other than that, the engines are very, very similar. They produce the same amount of horsepower uh, at the same rated RPM, and, um, and, and both of them are really excellent engines. Uh, I would be hard pressed to decide, um, you know, which is my favorite because they, they both are, are really, really good engines. All right, here we have the, um, the scavenge oil pumps for both a uh, the uh, SF7 RN1 um, W670 6N style engine and the VMN7 DF uh, W670 6A engine. You'll notice that the, um, the one for the 6N has a splined drive in here and the one for the 6A has a quarter inch square drive. Now for most people that's not going to make a lot of difference because most people are not going to be driving uh, fuel pumps off the back of their engines. But there are a few folks that are operating W670s on low wing airplanes or on airplanes that have a, um, a, fuel, a fuselage fuel tank where they will have to put a uh, fuel pump in and it will determine um, which fuel pump you use as to which engine you have. Uh, also this bolt pattern on the, um, the 6N 
uh, scavenge pump is different than the bolt pattern on the 6A. And so even though the, the uh, splines are different in there, so are the, uh, the bolt pattern. So the pump that, that fits the, this one will, will not even fit the bolt pattern for this one. And so, um, so it's important when choosing out fuel pumps, if you have to, that you're, that you're aware whether you have a W676A or a W676N. A couple of other W670 engine models that you may come across are the uh, W670M engine and the W670-23. Both the M and the Dash 23 are 240 horsepower engines versus the uh, 220 horsepower. And they, uh, they obtain that uh, extra horsepower by using a higher compression piston and also by turning the engine a little bit faster. The W670M was an early engine that, uh, that was actually developed during the 1930s. And the, uh, the M came in two varieties. One was with a two position valve on the nose case, so a little lever on the nose case that would allow you to put a controllable pitch propeller on it. Most of them used a, a 2B20 a constant speed propeller, but would have just used it as a two position. And so it was either in coarse pitch or fine pitch. The W670M engine also came without the uh, two position valve so that it was, uh, it was strictly a, um, a 240 horse that would use a wood prop or a, a ground adjustable propeller. The uh, W670-23 was a post-war development for the Cessna 190 series aircraft. The Dash 23 uses uh, the same high compression piston to develop 240 horse, but it has a propeller governor out on the nose case. It's a very uh, distinctive engine, easy to spot and easy to tell because it's the only one that will have a propeller governor out on the, uh, on the nose case. So those are a couple of the other um, uh, common, uh, fairly common aircraft engines that, um, that you'll come across. Now the, the other W670 engine that we haven't really talked about much is the W670 tank engine. The W670 tank engine was developed in the beginning of World War II um, for those landing craft and uh, Stuart tanks and, and other applications that we talked about a little bit earlier. And though the engines look very similar from the outside, uh, there actually are very few interchangeable parts. And that became sort of a, uh, a confused issue after World War II. People weren't sure, uh, can I use these tank parts in my aircraft engine? Uh, what, what should I do? And so in the early 1960s, the FAA uh, published about a five-page letter that described um, which parts were okay to use in a standard category aircraft and which parts should only be used in a, um, a restricted Part 8 type agricultural sprayer. And we have that, uh, that letter posted on our website so uh, you can go there and, and actually read the letter. It goes through the engine part by part describing the aircraft parts and the tank parts and the differences between the two. Probably the most important part that both of those engines share are the cylinders. The cylinder assemblies from a tank engine can be used interchangeably with the, uh, with the aircraft engine and, uh, and it's not a problem. So I would like to show you um, a few of the tank parts that are, are specific to the tank engine and so that if you come across them you'll know that, uh, that these aren't aircraft parts. All right, here we have uh, some gears. This is the, uh, the crankshaft starter gear, the oil pump drive gear, and the intermediate cam drive gear. The gears in the front row are all aircraft gears. The gears in the back row are all tank gears. The biggest thing that you'll notice is that the aircraft gears have lightning holes, uh, a large number of lightning holes drilled all the way around them. The tank gears have very much fewer lightning holes. Uh, the crankshaft starter gear has four oil pump drive gear and the intermediate cam gear each have two. Um, the other gears in the tank engine are, are similar. The, uh, uh, the magneto drive gears are, are similar. But um, uh, several years ago we had uh, an engine that uh, was overhauled in another shop that failed 
because this um, intermediate cam drive gear just absolutely shattered, just blew apart. And uh, there was an ensuing accident. The FAA contacted us and said, we would like to bring that engine to your shop so that, um, that we could tear it down and look at it. And in, uh, you know, the, the intermediate cam drive gear was what we found. It was split in four or five different, uh, different areas. And we actually had that gear tested. And we found that the metallurgy in this gear and the metallurgy in this gear were quite different. Now, we also found tank gears that had the same metallurgy as this, um, as this gear. So what has happened is uh, uh, there is now uh, an approval that is available where these tank gears can be used in uh, standard category aircraft providing that each one is tested. So each tank gear has to be tested to make sure that the metallurgy is correct before it can be used. But uh, just the, the practice of indiscriminately using uh, tank gears in aircraft engines um, is not only unsafe, it's illegal. This is an aircraft uh, crankshaft and this is a tank crankshaft. I've aligned the, uh, the counterweights here to show you the, uh, the differences in the cranks. You can see that the, uh, the tank crank is considerably shorter than the aircraft crank and also that the diameter of the splines on the aircraft crank are smaller than the, uh, than the diameter of the splines on the tank crank. This is a SAE 20 spline crankshaft and this is an SAE 30 spline crankshaft. Now that brings up an interesting point that we, we often get from, um, we get questions from people saying, well you talk about this being a 20 spline crankshaft, but, but mine has 16 splines. Uh, what, what's going on? Uh, when you say it's an SAE 20, that doesn't mean, that's not a count of the number of splines here. That is strictly a Society of Automotive Engineers number that they assigned to the diameter of, um, of these. So this is a 20, this is larger, this is a 30, this is what the, the uh, Pratt & Whitney R985 uh, is also an SAE 30 uh, crankshaft. The, uh, the 20s, the Jacobs, the um, Continentals, Lycomings, Wright E2s, those are all SAE uh, 20. And so, um, so the primary difference just visually um, is that you can, you can look at the crankshaft sticking out of a tank engine and say this is a tank engine because it's a much shorter crankshaft and it, the uh, splines are much larger than the uh, aircraft style. Now that is a, a quick, dirty uh, way to tell the difference between an aircraft engine and a tank engine, but it's not foolproof because back in the 1960s, uh, Gulf Coast Dusting uh, did a conversion on the tank crank where they actually machined this portion of the, uh, of the crankshaft down so that it was the same diameter as the aircraft shaft. Then they tapped it and threaded another portion on here and made it the same length as an aircraft shaft. That way you could use an aircraft propeller on the uh, tank engine. And they used that Gulf Coast conversion on a lot of uh, a lot of crop dusters, the early um, A model Ag Cats used them, and uh, and several other uh, dusting and spraying aircraft. Uh, but they're um, uh, even though that makes them a little more difficult to tell whether you're looking at an aircraft um, engine or a tank engine. There's one other way that we can tell, and I'll show you what that is. Now we have a front view of both of the crankshafts. This being the tank crank and this being the aircraft one. You'll notice that if we look right down the center, that on the tank crank, it has a, um, a machining center that's been drilled into there. This is a solid crankshaft um, all the way through, just one big solid chunk of steel. The aircraft shaft has a removable slotted plug in the very end. This is a hollow shaft, much, much lighter than the, uh, than the tank crank. Even when the tank crank was modified as a Gulf Coast uh, dusting crank, it still had that machining center. It, it stuck out another two inches, but it still had that machining center in it. So the very easiest way to locate uh, and to differentiate between a tank engine and an aircraft engine is look at the end of the crankshaft. The tank cranks, even if they've been modified, will always have that machine center there, and the aircraft shafts will always have that, uh, that plug.
This is a side-by-side -side comparison of the tank piston versus the aircraft piston. Now, if you'll notice, down inside the tank piston, it is, uh, it is smooth down in here, and you can, you can see the die casting marks, but other than that, it's, uh, it's smooth down in there. In the aircraft piston, however, there are uh, cooling fins, or what's called the waffle grid, that has been cast into there. Um, the, um, uh, the, the major difference between these two pistons is that this is a cast piston, and this is a forged piston. So, so this piston is much weaker and will not stand up to the abuse that the aircraft piston will. So even though the, these pistons look very similar from the outside, uh, the, the ca tank piston, the cast piston, should never be used in an aircraft engine. Uh, these, these pistons will last about 400 to 500 hours uh, before they develop cracks, usually through these oil holes that then run all the way around the piston and the piston will fail. Uh, these pistons, though you occasionally find them cracked, uh, almost never crack. They're, they're very tough, very durable, and they will wear out before they'll break. Um, these pistons will break long before they wear out. Now, though there are, there are many other differences between uh, the tank engine parts and the aircraft engine parts, uh, these show you the major differences. And um, if you want an exhaustive study of that, you can go to our website and, um, and check out that FAA letter.